What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another interview edition of Learn Crypto. My name is Nick Hellman, and today we have back Rob Viglione, the co-founder of Horizon. How are you doing today, Rob? Awesome, Nick. Thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure. If you want to learn more start to finish on what Horizon is, I recommend going to horizon.global or check out the previous interviews on my YouTube homepage. This uh, interview is going to be more high level, more what Horizon is, has just completed, what they're doing in the future, and we really want to see how they're bringing uh, incentives to the network for the users and the holders of Zen. So we're going to go over Horizon sidechains, the new white paper release, the Horizon development developer environment that you guys released, a tool there, as well as there, somebody was talking about how there was an election on Horizon blockchain. I don't think it is in a formal way that people are thinking, like ICON is trying to do with South Korea, but what it could mean for Horizon and the side chains in the future. So, I mean, I guess we can just start with side chains. Tell us a little bit about side chains. If you guys haven't already listened to the quarterly update, I think you should, but I'm more interested, what is the most important use case for Horizon side chains? And do super nodes or secure node holders benefit from them? Okay, uh, I, I'd say this is an action-packed agenda. Thanks for teeing it up, Nick. But so side chains are what is going to make blockchain scale uh, into the real world, and, and that's what it's all about. So it's about scalability, and in a way that makes sense for businesses to actually start participating. Now, what side chains mean, and maybe you know we need to do a little bit better of a job of branding, uh, but it means we have a core blockchain. Um, that is the traditional kind of blockchain, like a Bitcoin-like blockchain. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of other application-specific stuff that happens on their own functional blockchains that are linked to our, our main blockchain. So you can view this as like a hub-and-spoke model where you have kind of like a central or like a blockchain in, in the middle that controls and provides security for everything else and provides Zen, the, the cryptocurrency, this is the gas for the sidechain system. But... Anytime you want to do something specific, maybe like a tokenization platform, a voting platform, um, you know, a digital invoicing platform, an auction marketplace, or, or whatever you want to do, you would do that on your own dedicated or functional specific uh, blockchain. So for us, it's a really big deal. And, and I'll say because for the last three years of this project, we bootstrapped initially Zencash as a version of Zcash with different uh, governance, different economics, right? And we use that to build out uh, a massive, actually the biggest node network in the entire industry. So we have about 30,000 high quality servers that run our software and they're staked. So we have these node operators stake Zen to, in order to qualify for rewards from the block reward. Uh, now the whole benefit, the point of this wasn't just to lock up, you know, a third of our money supply, which it did. Uh, it was actually to build out a very large and high quality server network with stake already committed, it now could roll into proof of stake sidechain systems. So the first sidechain system that we're, we're gonna release with our beta, and we just released the alpha two weeks ago, uh, the first one with beta is gonna be a proof of stake Ouroboros Prowse protocol, which is basically the same protocol that Cardano uses. So we'll have a version, version of that running as a sidechain, so it'll be a proof of stake sidechain with our 30,000 node network, stake already committed, but we're you know, linking back to our proof of work blockchain for security. So that's, that's really the, the gist of it, but it's a really powerful technology that actually allows blockchain to scale because rather than having a one size fits all blockchain, uh, try to do a whole bunch of different types of businesses and you're all competing for throughput on that blockchain, mm -hmm. along with people that just have potentially frivolous cases mm -hmm. or uses for it, you actually have your own blockchain dedicated to what you need it to do. And we can talk about use cases there. We have a huge one in the works actually, probably the biggest use case that I've ever seen for blockchain we have as our first client on the sidechain system. And that's actually, you know, I, I don't know if you want to cut me off yeah. at any time, Nick, because no, I'm just fine. rolling Go right into it. Right into it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a company called Interfactora. It's the largest digital invoicing company in Mexico. They run about a third of Mexico's uh, digital invoicing through their, their system. And right now we're building a horizon sidechain to process the, these digital invoices to do it in a way that links with their competitors, links with regulators, links with tax authority, links with finance, financial firms within the industry who actually can now finance invoices and just make the entire process much more efficient. It is a classic use case for why you would want to use blockchain and we're building it out as our first use case. So, and you know, you have you, a big real world example there as well. Exactly. You know, people talk about this DeFi movement, but if you can aggregate all the DeFi apps in the world right now, and they would still be lesser in volume and economic impact than just our one side chain. Right. And I can see that because the thing with DeFi is you got to get users to switch over 
to these applications versus if you can attack or find a use case for something that already exists and do it more efficient, cheaper, and better, then you already have the user base, you already have the utilization there. Now you're just moving it over to the Horizon sidechain in this situation. Now, obviously sidechains are important because of scalability and throughput like you discussed, and you, you're you already talking about how somebody's about to jump on that. What is kind of the timeline for that to start happening? A, B, I would assume there's gonna be a large amount of transactions, even if you can only grab a fraction of all their uh, invoicing that they're doing, I'm assuming it's pretty large, maybe you know exact numbers, and then again, do, yeah, yeah. does do super node holders, secure node holders, both either uh, get any benefit from this growth and utilization from this uh, extra work they will have to be doing? Absolutely. So just for order of magnitude, so you can see the, the economic scale here, we're talking about just with this one client, about 200 million transactions per month, uh, which in, in three months would make us you know, have more transactions on, on our blockchain than Bitcoin or Ethereum right? In just three months worth of volume. So it, it's huge. Um, so yeah, you can talk micropayments and kind of fund flows throughout this, but fund flows also go to the node operators. So we are deploying a proof of stake sidechain. Um, so the node operators that we have currently are really, we built out this network so that we have an already staked high quality network of servers that can run software. So what we're doing now is we're offering all of them the opportunity to be uh, block forgers uh, and or certifiers. So we're gonna have a totally decentralized certifier system and they can also forge blocks of so process transactions, add them to you know to blocks and they compete based on the, the proportion of stake that they have. Wow, that's really so, interesting. Yeah. Now as I have nodes and I know people that have nodes, could you only do that extra work to get extra rewards if you're running them on your own? Uh, VPS server or do some of your recommended host providers such as ultimate nodes.io are they going to allow uh, that ability as well is that something that you've discussed with them or with anybody else or how does that work so we haven't because we're agnostic we're entirely agnostic we don't even want to know who's running uh, servers on our network so we're we're probably by definition you know based on our, our node network the most decentralized uh, blockchain network Right. And we want it to stay that way. We want it to actually grow and become more decentralized. So actually, we don't want to cut deals with people. Uh, we want to actually expand that. Now, everyone who runs a node, a qualifying node, well, in basically in, in the case of a side chain, the, the qualification is basically that you can run the software. So as long as your server is capable, minimally capable of running that software, just like running a Zen node currently, uh, then you qualify for, for rewards. Okay, perfect. Good answer. I guess maybe I'll have to do uh, some digging on my own then. <laughs> All right. I guess that kind of covers side chains. They're really interesting on some of the use cases, potential use cases, but I'm really impressed with that you guys are going into Mexico and you have a use case coming and it seems like the transactions that could be occurring on the horizon blockchain side chain uh, could be quite significant very soon. Cause usually in my opinion, utilization of a network drives value of a network and that's usually totally what happens in traditional markets. Now, with crypto right. it's a little bit different, but you would assume the assumption would be that that value has to has to go through to somewhere and in cryptocurrency it really only can be the native crypto and in this case Zen. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you my two Zen Toshis on that, Nick. I, I completely agree and I would say actually uh, so thus far as an industry we haven't really done a very good job of cultivating real economic value in our systems. The, the market values, in my opinion, are still largely speculative. Now, what, the next phase of maturity for the industry is actually drawing in uh, real-world revenue because we're actually solving real problems for businesses. And that's where we're trying to go. Right. Because then revenue creates sustainability for the network, or sustainability to hire exactly. more employees. And even though it's a decentralized network, that doesn't mean you can't have foundations working on the network as well to keep, yep. keep uh, bringing more uh, developments and use cases to the ecosystem. So it's all good there. Totally I guess agree. the next thing we'll uh, move on to is uh, a new white paper came out and mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin's white paper has been out now for 11 years and maybe there's been some additions, but primarily it's the yeah. same white paper that's been circulating yep. for 11 years. So why did horizon need a new white mm -hmm. chain? And if it is just additions, what are the new additions to the white paper? Yeah. So the big thing was, for the last three years before our sidechain alpha, we were really just uh, you know, a privacy coin. And the way the market perceived us and the way the market valued us was basically being a clone of a privacy coin. Now we bootstrapped that way um, because we, want, we wanted to expand and create a large network while we're doing the R&D in the background. 
and to actually experiment with and understand you know, zero knowledge cryptography. But with our sidechain alpha release, we became a privacy platform, truly a privacy platform. So it's a completely different project or maybe an evolution of the same project. Uh, but this actually helps us have a, a much more sustainable, scalable architecture. So if you just looked at our old white paper, and as we have you know, many new participants and members of our ecosystem, we were pointing them towards our white paper and really it doesn't make sense for us anymore. Now we're, we're a totally different tech stack and you know, really we've come, come a long way as a project in the last three years. Right. I like to kind of say Horizon is a, creating a privacy ecosystem and Zen is the privacy coin that runs the ecosystem. Now we'll see yes. how much that scales up as we keep getting more use cases like the one that you just described. Right. But if you've already read the white paper, I think you need to give the new one a little bit of a read. I know white papers can be the, a little high level for some individuals, but there's still some good uh, you know, thesis statements or good points that you can kind of skim over and get a better grasp of what Horizon is trying to do yeah. and maybe what you should look for mm -hmm. on other crypto projects as well when you're trying to compare apples to apples. So well, we'll talk about high level stuff. So I guess, do you want to explain a little bit what this Horizon developer tool is and why it's important? You know, I saw the announcement come out it really didn't get a lot of uh, comments, a lot of shares, because not a lot of people are developers, but why is it important for developers and why does it really matter for Horizon and Zen? So it solves two problems that, that I, I see in open source environments. So the first problem is uh, people don't know what to work on. So you, you have a lot of motivated people that if you just look at a GitHub repository and, and all of the, the projects that are ongoing, it's really hard to figure out, you know, what what should you be working on? What are the opportunities? Right? And is do you do your, do your ideas conform to the strategy of the overall system? All right. So problem one that we solve is we create a curated environment where we actually devote resources, not even to do development, but to curate the development opportunities to really point people to where these are the important things to do. And we're doing this in a way that's uh, like a social environment, sort of gamified with uh, built-in incentives. So we, we actually go and we create um, you know, everything from, if you want to learn how to code and participate, that's great. We'll teach you how to code and show you exactly where to code. If you're you know, uh, maybe a, a four or five year out of college computer scientist, you can participate. Or if you're a 20 year senior software architect, there, there will be projects for you as well. The second thing that I see is an, uh, kind of a, an unsustainable aspect of open source is that in, in the past, the, the uh, expectation has always been to participate for free. So basically what this does is it creates like a hobby group or a hobby culture. And what we want is really high quality engineering. And that's what we built is a really high quality engineering team. And we want to sustain that. We, we don't want to dilute the quality of the products or the code that we're delivering. So we want to actually pay people. You know, so we have this endogenous you know, compensation mechanism where we pay so even just like simple bounties or bounties that grow over time based on participation in, in a gamified um, way. That's really interesting. Yeah, I saw the demo for it and it kind of seemed like you had a whole list of different tasks that people could opt to start working on. And then maybe yeah. it notifies when somebody else is already working on it and you had rewards right. from one Zen to 10 Zen. Obviously that then creates a priority as more people are going to want to work on right. it. It is more. And, uh, right. and also allows developers of all different skills to also participate and be active because maybe they can only handle a one Zen bounty versus a more experienced dev can go for the 10, 10 Zen bounty. So I think that's, that's really exactly right. In the vision that I would love to see this, I would love to partner with universities and we have some talks there where we can get computer science classes to participate as part of their projects even. All right, so there's so many different ways that we can take this, but I think overall it's a huge step forward for open source. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Not only for Horizon, but also for open source mm -hmm. because if you guys do get in universities, right. I mean, think of how many people that opens up to cryptocurrencies, to developing, mm -hmm. to, hey, I can do this work while I'm in college and get incentivized for it and partici to participate in something else. So yeah. I think that would be really interesting. And it makes a professor's job really easy. They'll just be like, hey, case study, you got to finish one Zen bounty by the end of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I guess really the last thing we wanted to talk about before we kind of just, I can get some random points from you, but. You know, somebody was saying there's a Guatemalan election on the Horizon blockchain. And at first I was like, whoa, is this like how South Korea is trying to do an actual election on yeah. Icon IC, ICX's blockchain or what happened there? And is, mm -hmm. is governance, is elections mm -hmm. a feasible use case for blockchain in the future? Oh, it's a fantastic use case. So actually we've already prototyped a voting system that uses, that uses ZK snarks for secret, secret voting, has a liquid democracy function where you can delegate 
um, your steak because it's steak weighted. Um, so it, it kind of solves a, a interesting mix of um, like game theory mechanics for how, how you want to design a voting system. Uh, but that's just in prototype. What we actually plan to do with that is to open up the governance of our entire ecosystem to a, a voting system on a side chain. Um, so we talked about this a little bit before, the critical dependency there is, you know, we said on a side chain. What we did two weeks ago is we delivered the alpha version of our side chain system. We'll have the beta version delivered at the end of Q1, and then we, we'll have a, kind of a, a lag before we actually push it to production. Then we can really get working on the, the voting system that will govern the entire ecosystem. Now, what we did with Guatemala was basically we had a community developer uh, working with a partner that we have on the ground in Guatemala um, to solve a problem that they had was um, potential impropriety and uh, polling station results. So there was the, the idea that results from polling stations may be tampered with. So what they did to solve this was they took literally pictures of results from polling centers. Like there were 21,000 of them roughly. And then what we did was we had one of our community devs, uh, P. Stu, by the way, he's amazing. And uh, he's the guy behind Ultimate Nodes. And he um, created a tool where you hash the, the voting records and then we, we pump those into the, the Horizon blockchain just so that we can prove that, you know, at least from the point where the documents were produced, nothing had been tampered with from there. And then he, he built a nice retrieval tool so you can go on there, you can type in, you know, Guatemala and you'll be able to see, or he, he, has, he has some easy ways to be able to see the results. So it was just a nice way to show that, hey, we care about democracy. We care about, you know, good governance. So we, we want to use this technology for good. And this was one simple use case, but our side chain system is going to take this to the next level. That, that's really interesting to be able to do that. First of all, I know that that can probably occur on Bitcoin or many blockchains with the fact that you guys had a developer step up and you guys had the connections to do it. Maybe that means that uh, those connections grow as your tech grows and maybe the voting will actually occur on the side chain rather than just hashing it into the blockchain for memory purposes. So we'll, totally. see, how that, that's a uh, point. we'll see how that evolves. I mean, we've really talked about a lot of things here. So if you want to kind of wrap it up or if there's anything about Horizon that you want to mention now for people who do know what Horizon is, don't know what Horizon is, or uh, I think you guys, are you guys doing a Singapore event uh, soon here in November? I mean, this is like conference yeah. season, you know, not alt season, not Bitcoin season. Everybody's talking about <laughs> conferences with Meridian, with Swell. I think you guys at B&B may be going to Singapore for a conference or two as well. I am. So actually, uh, next week, I'll be in Singapore um, speaking with, actually, this is a great point, our partners at Flipside Crypto. So Flipside Crypto is a company that partnered with Moody's to provide independent ratings of projects in the industry. Um, so what they do is they, they have a whole bunch of criteria by category, like one category would be like development or your engineering quality. Another category would be like user activity. Do people actually use your your tools, your blockchain? And then there's like market maturity and, and there's subcategories within these buckets. And then they rate thousands of projects in the industry. And it turns out that we, this, you know, very uh, maybe lesser known project, we're, t we're actually top 10 in the entire industry. So in terms of fundamental crypto asset score, we're ranked as number 10 in the industry. We're ranked number 10, number five in engineering quality. Um, so it's, it's kind of a little known fact about the project, but I'm actually going out to go on stage with Flipside Crypto. They're going to introduce their tool uh, talk about how this is a new type of market intelligence that gets away from just biases mm -hmm. uh, and goes towards more like algorithmic or unbiased assessment of projects. And then I'm going to come up on stage because we're, we're sort of the outlier uh, for, for, for their system. Their, their system identified us as one of the highest quality projects in the, in the industry before I think a lot of other people realize that because a lot of the innovative work that we did, like on side chains, for instance, was done in private repositories and we just went public with it, but they were able to pick up that metadata activity from our, our GitHub before anyone else. So it's, it's, it's a nice story for us to get up there on stage in Singapore and, you know, they, they mentioned here's really the, the, you know, golden child project that no one else, you know, realizes is so high quality and we identified them. Well, there you go, guys. It's conference season. They're going to a conference saying that not only will they be talking themselves, but they'll be talking with Flipside Crypto. For those of you who don't do a lot of analytics or analysis, I like to think of it as a fundamental crypto score. A lot of you look at market capitalizations, which is the value of the network. Well, the value of Zen's network, I don't, I, you're not talking about price here. I am a little bit. The value of <laughs> Zen's network is somewhere around 100 to 105. So usually not on your first page of coin market cap for everybody. But the fundamental score from Flipside Crypto, who is going to be presenting, has you guys, it was 19, then 15, and now 10. 
So if you would like to put research together to kind of create an evaluation, you have a fundamental score of 10, but you're having a market value score of 105. Usually those gaps don't exist or not for long. So I, I don't know in which direction, which one will move, uh, but you guys can decide that. But usually those will converge to a median and uh, we'll kind of see what happens. So that is very interesting. Uh -huh. I could, I could guess the direction because our quality is not decreasing. Uh, so, but yeah, no, it, it's an interesting thing. And it was shocking to me to see Zen list you know, shown on um, market watch the other day because they list the, the FCAS top 10 and we, we just made that list now. So that's pretty huge. Now you got to keep working to stay on that list, right? Yeah, exactly. No, and move on. We, we need to dominate that list. There you go. <laughs> so. Was there anything else that I missed that you wanted to go over? Anything else? I mean, not really. So I, you know, I, what I always try to encourage is for people to actually participate. So even if you, you decide to invest in Zen or, you know, run a node, for instance, I think what's most important for us is that you join our community and amplify the message of what we're doing um, to get it out there. So this really is a community project and we're, we've actually gone through a bit of an internal, uh, you know, re restructuring in the sense that we, you know, we have a couple of different organizations in our ecosystem. We have you know, Horizon, we have uh, Horizon Labs, which is a commercial entity. And we really defined very clearly, Horizon is a community startup first. We use technology and, and we innovate on in technology, but it's a community startup first. So we need people like you, Nick. We need people that run nodes. We need people that invest in Zen or, or participate in any way to really get out there and join, join the movement. Right. I think that's a good thing to reiterate. During the crypto winter, I think the crypto ecosystem became more just focused on just investors. Right. But really, in order for the ecosystem to move forward, for blockchain technology to move forward, it needs everybody. I know a lot of projects don't like talking about investors because then there's regulatory gray area, so you don't have to do that. Right. But you need investors, you need traders, you need users, sure. and you need stakers. These things are being yep. created to be used in the future. So it's not, right. I know everybody wants to speculate, but the people that are running nodes are showing a belief in the growth of the underlying network and with the hope of, hey, if I'm earning X amount of rewards per month, I can now use... Uh, this side chain or I can use this privacy chat feature and you can use your rewards to then pay for these other services that you can use in the yeah. future as well. No, totally agree. And maybe the last uh, fun fact that I'll throw out there for you guys. And this is, uh, I'm kind of a stats nerd. I love stats and uh, our, our growth marketing team has just been killing it recently. So our community is growing about uh, three to 5,000 people per day and it's wow. fluctuating in that, in that range. So it's huge. Wow. It's uh, sort of going viral. Um, so, you know, it, it won't be long before we have a million person community and then beyond that, especially with projects like Interfectora, uh, I expect that to scale even faster. So it, it's fun. It's a fun time, exciting for the project. We really just had our coming out a couple of weeks ago. It was a privacy platform that's totally innovative. We built that entire system from scratch. It's not a clone of any other project. And now we're growing like weeds. So it's just a really fun time to be around. That is really interesting. You're talking about stats. I put a tweet out today. I was looking at Grayscale's new, like they always put a monthly assets under management. I like to keep an eye on that to see if there's more institutional interest coming to the market. And the things that jumped off to me is first of all, Bitcoin is up to 262,000 Bitcoin or one and a half percent of the circulating supply. And remember, these are all locked up guys. Legally, they can't stake them. They're not actively trading them. They're just kind of serving as a custodian for investors and users. Ethereum is 470,000 at a half a percent. Ethereum Classic is 8.75 million at 7.6% and they give back one third of those fees to developers of Ethereum Classic, which is interesting. And then Zen is on the list. 367,000 Zen are now locked up and uh, invested in. 4.76% of the current circulating supply. I would imagine that's gonna continue to grow. Um, and I think that just shows the interest from institutions or grayscale investors in Zen, in Ethereum Classic, in others. And I guess, is there ever a plan to maybe work out some kind of develop, developer deal with Grayscale, kind of like Ethereum Classic has done, where you will That's receive a portion of their fees in order to maybe have Grayscale Foundation or Horizon Labs or whatever it may be? So that's a really interesting question, Nick. And you know, I'll bring it up to those guys because they are the best supporters that you could possibly have. They, they invest heavily in the project, but not just in, in you know, capital. They invest uh, reputation. They're constantly going out there and advocating for us because they've done significant due diligence and, you know, and we, we've just had a very strong relationship, but they also advocate for doing the right thing. So these guys are very long-term oriented and they're looking to build 
long-term value protocols and ecosystems. So it would not surprise me at all if they do something like that. I mean, I, I, it's good on them to do something like that with Ethereum Classic. We, we don't expect anything, but all along they're advocating for more decentralization, you know, stronger governance, governance and really just amazing people to have as like a like a anchor point for the entire ecosystem. All right. And the reason I brought up that they're legally, they're not going to be staking or trading that is I've had people concerned in the past, like, Oh, they have all this ownership. It's making, creating centralization in Ethereum classic, mm -hmm. for example, because they have 8% AUM realize that that 8% yeah. is broken up by thousands of investors. A, and then in the case for Zen, they're not making however many nodes, 367,000 would be. Those are locked up in their own separate pocket and not part of the right. node network. So that way you're not having a centralization of those nodes as well, making the network centralized. So really it's a positive because if you're saying 30% of the network is locked up in nodes, now you have another 367,000 locked up by this custodian. Uh, right. There's only so much out there in the active ecosystem being used, traded, speculated on. So I just thought that was really interesting as I was going over the numbers. Totally That's great. That's lot. awesome. That's about all I got. Any last words, Rob? Are we going to wrap no, it up? No, no, it is always, always a pleasure. So, and by the way, yeah, I liked your tweet earlier. So. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Thanks. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you'll, you've got to start packing up for uh, the two conferences in Singapore, I believe you're doing. If I read uh, Coin Market Cal correctly, I recommend that website as well to keep up to date with what your projects are doing mm -hmm. or conferences you can attend. So this is kind of a higher level overview of what Horizon has done lately and what they're doing in the future. Again, if you want uh, basics of Horizon, head to horizon.global or check out my other interviews on this YouTube homepage. And hopefully we will see you guys soon. Me and Todd Father do go live four times a week talking about technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and crypto news. So until next time, stay tuned for your daily updates on cryptocurrencies right here at Learn Crypto.